Aloha friends, it's Robert Stelic. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Planet Show, where I interview foil athletes, designers, and thought leaders, and get lots of good information for those foil crazy people out there like you and me. This year I didn't post a lot of interviews, but I'm kind of ending this year, 2022, with a bang with two really good interviews. Um, today's interview is with Mike's Lab, founder Mike and partner Stefano. They make some of the best foils in the world, the fastest foils in the world, hand built in San Francisco and in Italy. The story, background story is really cool as well. You know, Mike uh, grew up in Czechoslovakia, communist Czechoslovakia, where he started building uh, windsurf equipment um, and making it for his friends and then uh, escaping uh, over the border, risking his life to escape communist Czechoslovakia and ended up in the West and eventually in San Francisco, started making windsurf boards again uh, for some of the top athletes in the world and then getting into foils. At the time of the interview, I only had one quick session on my 600 mic slab foil. Since then, I've been able to try it more and also use it on a really long downwind run in epic conditions from Hawaii Kai to White Plains, uh, where we winged like about 40 miles downwind, uh, super fun. And that's where I could really tell um, how fast this foil is. You know, I, I went out with some really fast guys and was able to kind of smoke them in, in some of the runs just because the foil was um, really quick and easy to control. And I was just able to uh, make, make these big drops on these big bumps. And, and so I had a great time with it. I might include some of that footage in this during this interview. And then also I have some really nice footage of Alan Cadiz using his uh, five, I think it's a 540 Mike's Lab foil in Kailua. Um, and I uh, got some cool drone footage of him going super fast on that foil as well. So um, I hope you enjoy the, this interview. And uh, next week's interview is going to be with Ken Winner. He's the designer at Duotone and uh, making some of the best wings on the market and also uh, was really the first one to make inflatable wings for foiling. So uh, he's definitely a pioneer and a really good story. Um, you know, started as a windsurf professional and then got into the design side of things. So, uh, and he really shared a lot about the, his wing designs and philosophy and et cetera. So that's a really good show as well. And I'm gonna post that the following Saturday, which is December 24th and wishing everyone happy holidays. And so without further ado, here is Mike and Stefano with Mike's Lab. So welcome Stefano and Mike to the Blue Planet show. Today's show is about Mike's Lab foils. So uh, thanks so much for joining me. I've been waiting for quite a while to get you on the show. So, and I, and I finally got my own Mike's Lab foil. I've only tried it one time, unfortunately, but um, really, um, really excited about it. Um, so welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. And uh, actually, let's start with uh, where you're joining from. So we're kind of spread out all over the world here. All right. Well, I'm in Siena, Italy. And, and I'm close to San Francisco. Yeah. And then I'm in Honolulu, where it's uh, morning time. And I think for you, it's... Uh, Mike is midday and for Stefano it's kind of late in the evening so yeah, thanks for making yeah. the time to to join the Blue Planet Absolutely. show. <laughs> God, my my video is kind of doing funky stuff but so anyway um let's talk a little bit about your background um I just I just heard Mike um saying that you um you basically had to um escape from or yeah tell us about a little bit about your background how, how you got to where you are now. Maybe start with Mike. Yeah, so obviously I went to grade school, then apprentice training for cabinet making, but kind of high-end cabinet making, you know, the European stuff, which you may keep for generations rather than the whatever I learned here, uh, kitchen cabinets with a staple gun. <laughs> Very different. And then I went to, like, high school with kind of orientation for architecture, interior design, and furniture design. And after that, I worked for about a year 
in interior design in the office and also in the what, what is it shop like a uh, shop and we were catering to diplomats in Prague taking care of the residences you know preparing all that and about 1978 actually exactly I started making windsurfing boards uh, because that was one thing we were kind of allowed to do <laughs> because uh, my brother took on hang gliding and that was a no-no especially close to the border so that quickly became somewhat outlawed except the one little hill in center of Czech Republic so that's why me and my friends we picked up windsurfing and you know so 78 I made the first one and that's how I actually introduced myself into epoxy and all that and I kept making boards until 2012 Actually more, that was the end of windsurfing boards. And then the kite boards went on for another, I would say three to four years. But during the end of that time, uh, the foil came on and I was able to jump on probably the first sword foil, which was imported into America by Brian Lake. And he left for a week somewhere and he said, yeah, Mike, hey, he, have at it. <laughs> And I, it was a very interesting time. He couldn't quite do it yet. It was a skim board. I put footsteps on it so I can even try it because I hate boards without footsteps. Hmm. And yeah, it was, it was difficult. He thought he wasted his money. <laughs> soon, very soon after he came back, he learned enough that he was doing the, I think it was Friday night races on kite boards. And very quickly, he started winning the weather mark. And so we kind of knew this is the way to go. And so, so I'm sorry to both. interrupt you, but this was all still in the Czech Republic, right? No, 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 no. no. I, so, I escaped in 1983. And what are we are talking about now, maybe 2014. So there's 30 years between. Okay. So, but okay. So you were saying. Back, so the, back in the Czech Republic, you're doing an apprenticeship for d building furniture and so on. And then, yeah. and then you started um, playing with hang gliders and building windsurfers. Correct. Was that, that was all still in the Czech Republic. Yes. And and I'm, I'm sure that at that time you weren't really able to buy any goods from the West. So you had to basically build your whole rig and everything or like how, yeah. how, was, how did that work? So back then, yeah, we basically bought it was actually a pre-molded piece of styrofoam, but we didn't like the shape, so we reshaped it a little bit and then laid it up with fiberglass and epoxy. And for, let's say, Universal, we had friends like machine fittings where the high-pressure hose would fit into, get screwed from, the, from both sides with like heavy-duty bolt expand the high pressure hose into this little Delrin housing that was our universal and then we fitted the aluminum mast which is just a piece of pipe and same thing for the boom which i found two trees and started bending my aluminum pipe to make a boom and then i yeah. screwed the ends together and i'm sure everybody started like that <laughs> well everybody in in eastern europe right yeah, because I I grew up in in uh, West Berlin, but we had friends in East Germany, and they had to basically build their own equipment unless we brought them something over from the West, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I recall the beginnings in Maui, like early seventies, and nobody was making anything, and they were pioneering their their own right. way. Oh, so that was that early you got into windsurfing, like yeah, back I was seventy eight, maybe. Okay just a few years later and mm -hmm. certainly couldn't buy except those pre-molded styrofoam blanks somebody was able to put together probably on the side in some factory and uh, yeah that's what we bought and we could buy epoxy and fiberglass that was doable okay and then and then talk a little bit about how you escaped from the czech republic and made it to the u.s so me and my, well, our dad was always kind of on a 
dissident side, but he never got too much in trouble except getting fired from pilot school. But his friends, uh, they were persecuted a little bit more to the point that some of them ended up in uranium mines. And actually, two sons of one of this, these friends helped us later on. But first, we took a vacation in Yugoslavia, and we contacted these couple sons of a of my dad's friend who in the meantime died as probably the result of the mines. <clears throat> so they researched an area how we can, or where it's kind of safe to jump the fence between Yugoslavia and Italy. First, we tried to sail from Yugoslavia to Italy across like this Northern Bay. We were quickly stopped by patrol boat, uh, and we were in the wetsuit, so they just sent us back. Then uh, later on, I remember being in some kind of a police station. I think that's when we came up to the border crossing and they basically took us out and did a little interview. <laughs> and the third time, that was a few days later, uh, these friends from Switzerland came and we started talking, strategizing, and they had this city in Yugoslavia where some other Czech people were able to just jump the fence in the middle of the city. And so that's what we ended up doing. And we abandoned our car on the Yugoslavian side and they basically loaded us into their car. And from dark Midnight Italy, we drove all the way to Vienna refugee camp, which is Austria, where the waiting line was a lot shorter. And we just had to lie to authorities there that that was the first country we stepped our foot on. So we would be able to stay in a refugee camp and apply for asylum. Wow. So this was like, I guess this was before the Berlin Wall came down and, and things like that. What, oh, yeah. what year What year was that? I. This was 83 and Berlin Wall came down in 89. Oh, okay. So that's when the borders were really, still really strict and hard to, oh, yeah, hard yeah, to cross, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Wow. So that, I mean, you're basically risking your life doing that, right? Yeah, kind of, if you don't do it in the right spot. So my yeah. cousin was actually in the army and he was patrolling the border and there was like 50 kilometer dead zone and they had machine guns, you know, him and his buddy and, and dogs basically patrolling the this dead zone with uh, electrical fences and all that. And my cousin decided to escape. This was like two years before I did it. So he knew that it was a bad area. And he was so soft that his parents were actually, just his dad was allowed to go to the refugee camp talk to him and he managed to bring him back. And so he got a little filled in how it goes because he worked on the border and he escaped. And I, I'm sure his body was a deep doo-doo after, you know, wow. his whatever colleague escapes. But anyway. So then you applied for um, as asylum, I guess, in, in Europe. And then, but how did you make it to San Francisco, I guess? <laughs> So yeah, you apply, you wait a few months. We had an interview with ambassador, US ambassador in Vienna. And once he okayed us, we in the meantime joined this uh, American fund for Czechoslovak refugees, which was financing the flights, you know, to come to US. And we were asked where they were gonna send us to Boston and we kind of thought further away from Europe would be a better idea. And luckily we got San Francisco, so we ended up directly to here. They paid us first month's rent. And after that, we were on our own. Uh, luckily we got welfare the first few months. And yeah, after, I, I literally started working in a cabinet shop two weeks after arrival with zero English. <laughs> some French, enough Russian, and luckily a Russian guy 
hired me for his shop, so I, I was able to speak Russian to him at first. But he had three other young guys like me, and I picked up English from them within a few months pretty okay, especially when it's just about work. You know, it's it's not, it wasn't too bad. Wow. So, I mean, yeah, now, and now your English is very good. So that's impressive. How, how old were you when you, when you got to the United States? 23. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So, okay. That's a, a amazing story. So, and then, and then, yeah. So then you got a job and then how did you get into um, making, making your own foils? Well, first it was the boards. I kind of jumped from that 78 back in Czech. I made at least six Windsor boards. And then here I am in San Fran driving by Berkeley where I see dozens of windsurfers having fun. And I go, I got to, you know, get back to it. Me and two other friends, we bought this production, like horrible quality boards and started going out there and later on i realized yeah i probably have to make me my own board again and it was 1985 when i made my first board maybe 86 one of those and i managed to cut my finger pretty badly in that process <laughs> and i finished the board injured and three of my friends tried it and they immediately said yeah we need something like that we we want same board so i had three customers before i could ever try my first board out here <laughs> <laughs> and i slowly shifted from cabinet making and a little bit later construction because my russian boss managed to fire me for asking him a question <laughs> so i went into a short period of construction and from that i was able to meander into making boards and so, so that's how you started um, basically you started your own business building boards yeah in 86 full time okay the 87 and then yeah and then talk about yeah how that evolved into mike's lab i guess well, I called it, believe it or not, my slab right then for the first board, just oh, as a joke that I'm some big operation. <laughs> it was, you know, nothing. And yeah, I was making in inroads into the local scene, racing myself, pushing it, and then local racers like Bart Chrisman and Steve Sylvester, they kind of noticed sooner then later they got their own boards made by me even though bar christman was making his own uh, but uh, it was too much work for him <laughs> and now he's using my foils that's crazy uh, hmm. literally what is it 37 years later or 40 maybe <laughs> uh yeah so i'm making boards and in 1996 matt pritchard asks me to make him a board and he picks it up on the way to Hood River Nationals and he wins by a long shot, like all bullets by long distance. So immediately Kevin stepped in. Then Kevin won his first World Cup PWA, beating Bjorn Dunkerbeck, interrupting his 13 year winning streak on my board, which was a big deal. And wow. I think it was 1999. And Phil again calls me and he goes, Mike, you gotta come over. Kevin's gonna do it. And sure enough, I just made the awards. And that was a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Okay. So Matt and Pritchard kind of put you on the map a little bit with the wind yeah. boards. And yeah, later on it was all kinds of other people like Phil McGain, Scott Fenton, Micah Bozanas. Uh, many others. They all used Kip Finney and Miniard. Yeah, Lisa Newberger. Who was there's plenty of others. So in the in the whole time, like basically, 
you're not really sponsoring these these guys. They're just buying boards from you because you make the fastest boards. Or did, were you making boards for free for some of those guys? No, they had to pay me. I was still very poor, barely making it. So uh, to the top guys, I was trying to keep the price down so they can keep selling it. And they did. They sold the board for at least the same, if not more. But I didn't have to do the paperwork or all that. So I just yeah, collected money and they uh, let them deal with it. So uh, early on, pretty much everybody had to pay me, but I was very reasonable with the prices, hopefully. <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah, it's a little bit like I, I was talking to Mark Rappahorst, um, who started SIC, and um, all the best guys were buying his boards because they were the fastest boards available, and you didn't really have to sponsor anybody because, you know, that's a nice, nice position to be in. Yeah, that's where I. <laughs> but, and but it seems like to the, to this day, it's kind of like you have more like you. It seems like you have a long waiting list to for these foils. Like I had to wait, I don't know, like three or four months to get a foil. Um, what what's your wait time? And and I don't know, like is that. Is that kind of how you try to keep it where you basically you can't make as many as people want or like what's yeah what's your well, philosophy stefan i should men, uh, jump in here in let's yeah. say the waiting times and the list but yeah. i would say boards you can almost kind of go in and let's say have it have been made in cobra which we did with the kite boards and they were pretty dang good but i don't really see how our design could be successfully made somewhere in China without us looking it over. And we did try to teach an outfit here in Michigan, I believe. And we slept through about, I don't know, six months, maybe a year, and it still wasn't, the quality wasn't there. So it's not so easy. So I, Steph, Steph should jump in. Yeah. Here. Well, yeah, actually, sure. like, okay, so actually, Stefano, like, maybe start talking a little bit about your background, like how you got yeah. into this business. Sure. Okay. So um, Mike is one of my best friends. I've known him since I was uh, 18 years old. I'm, I'm 48 now. And uh, I, yeah, whew, time flies. And so I met Mike at the Berkeley Marina windsurfing because I um, caught the windsurfing bug when I was 17 and I met him when I was 18. And I was um, at the Berkeley Marina and I would see him and all these other guys just go up, up and down and upwind up to Treasure Island training every day. And as a senior in high school at that time, I got off at um, around noon, just after noon. So I was going to Berkeley every day and I just saw that as a goal I wanted to achieve to be able to, you know, be as fast as those guys and be able to go upwind as fast as those guys. And I was on this super heavy polypropylene Tiga windsurf board. And I would just, you know, slug up there. And I finally remember finally making it all the way up to Treasure Island and seeing Mike and the others dancing around, playing, doing big jumps. And I chased them back downwind and I tracked Mike down in the parking lot and we started talking. And, then I, and for me, Mike's lab as a board maker and as a person was already a legend at that point in the windsurfing scene. So I remember going up to him and like, oh my gosh, you got a new Mike's lab. Oh, when did you get it? And Mike was like, oh, I, I made it. <laughs> and so that just sort of started the whole conversation there. And um, Mike, you know, gave me an awesome deal. My very first Mike's lab board was a one that had, um, broken and taken up water and he was able to cut the whole thing in half and let it dry out and repair it so he sold it to me for cheap and I, I paid it off by digging under his house uh, an addition an additional room under his house because as a high school student I didn't have that kind of money <laughs> and so yeah so that's how our friendship started is um, you know out there on the race course so to speak and um I'm a product designer, so I went to San Jose State and studied product design. So I'm sort of right in the middle between uh, mechanical engineering and fine art. Um, and uh, so, you know, during my university days, 
and on weekends I'd be working in a windsurfing shop on the summers I'd be doing all the local race circuit and everything like that and often would find myself at Mike's for dinners and jacuzzi time and just philosophizing on life and that's how our friendship started and um, then in 2006 I met my Italian wife and I have Italian relatives too uh, over here and so I decided to um, move over here. And in 2014 is when we started the whole hydrofoil project. And since as a product designer, I have, you know, I've been doing CAD and 3D and tool design and things like that since, since 1994. Um, and so, uh, I proposed to Mike, like, hey, let's, you know, let's, I, I knew the scene in San Francisco was already blowing up and Mike was already sending me messages about it. And I wanted to get into it too. Um, and I'm just one of the people like, I, I love to just build everything. Um, and I'm always more satisfied to be out on the water if it's something that I've made. Um, so uh, I was just saying, hey, let's, you know, start a project together. Uh, just almost like a hobby, you know, I'll, we'll design it together and Mike will do all the first layups. I'll do all the tool design. I'll make the first molds. Um, I should jump in quickly in here. Yeah. So I got that sword. Then soon enough, I got spots foil as well. Shortly after that, F4 started making their own foil. And I was hacking together literally hundreds of pieces with thousands of combinations for maybe a couple of years and never really kind of figured out what what it needs and where is the problem and i know i couldn't control the sort in pitch and spots in left right and i knew it could be combined and i'm telling stefano and he goes well let's make our own and there it was <laughs> <laughs> yeah wow. so it started so before you met and i guess that was in the early 90s when when you guys met uh, when you were 18 so before that did you grow up in california or yeah. Um, yeah yeah i was born in san francisco and i grew up in the bay area yes oh, okay and then so basically you married an italian wife your italian wife and then moved to basically moved to italy yeah and then mm -hmm. and then so now you make basically you make foils as well in in Italy yeah so so the whole the whole development process with Mike is that you know from 2014 when things started just kind of almost as a hobby but then quickly started getting requests and things like that um I was always doing the design work the tooling um and we would always sort of hash out over at that particular time Voxer now we use what's up but uh, you know, just uh, chats to sort of refine and go over our, the designs. And I would then come over once or twice a year um, to work with him in his garage and help boost production because we, we quickly got to the point where we just could not meet demand. Um, and we um, had to uh, get some more man, you know, hands in there, so to speak. So I would come over a couple times a year to do these production sessions and um and at that particular time i i was also teaching at a um a university here in italy different design uh, courses and curriculum and um then in 2019 the demand got so much where it justified me opening up my own shop over here so um uh so from 2019, I've had my own lab, so to speak, um, where I produce a lot of the foils that are then sold on over here in Europe. Wow. Okay. Great story. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share this um, these cool sketches that you emailed me. Uh, I'm gonna screen share it, and um, sure, and yeah. I guess I guess can you see them? Yeah. 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 Okay. So I guess at that time you guys were. Um, you know, one of you was in the Bay Area and one is in, in Europe and in Italy. And then you were making these for kite kite foiling, right? Yeah. So, so you know, these first sketches are one of our very first designs. Um, and 
you know, we, Mike and I both have sort of the philosophy where we, we just got to try stuff and learn by doing, you know, we are definitely of the trial and error philosophy. And so this, these are sketches of our very first design, which had, you know, the mass mounted directly over the wing. And I would often 3D print, um, you know, stuff and send it over to Mike so he could have it in his hands. And what you're seeing, all those little pieces, seven through two and A, B, C, D, those were all the first sort of positive mold, like that I sent to Mike because our very first design, I, I made negative molds by, by 3D printing them and backfilling them with resin and MDF, but it ended up getting lost in the shipping. So then a few months later, I had to send him the positives, which then he made molds of. Uh, so just for a good laugh, that was our very first design. Okay, so these little pieces, you made 3D printed molds and then built, the, um, you know, basically um, made the parts and then put them all together and to, to make yeah, one those, foil. I sent him all the pieces and he could put them all together and then make a mold himself out of fiberglass or whatever he did at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. And this is where you, you were a little bit younger still. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, and, talk, know, here's, here's talk sketches, you know, where we're thinking about, you know, how to keep the tips from popping out of the water, you know, just, just what seems so obvious now, but at that time, you know, these were all considerations that we were making. Right. Yeah. And here's a little cross section of, of how uh, I was going to make the 3d printed mold to send them. And, and I, this, I mean, this was a, it was such a tragedy because I, for months I printed all these pieces, made this huge mold, and it, it just literally got lost in shipping and just damaged. It's probably some buried in some warehouse in America somewhere. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, but yeah, my, so talk talk a little bit about this. I mean, is, is this like a, your secret sauce, or can you share a little bit about no. like how you built your molds, and if are you still do, using that same process? Uh, no, the, the not at all. So this was um, in the beginning, we used the 3D um, printing to make the first molds, but we quickly realized that it's just not accurate enough. So, you know, when you're when you're dealing with making and designing and making hydrofoils, you have to have much higher tolerances. And so um, we quickly moved on to aluminum molds. However, having said that, often in our design process between Mike and I, Mike is somebody that really likes to have something, you know, between his hands that he can sort of feel the profile and, and uh, help visualize the connection. And um, so often I would print out little pieces and, and send them to him just so he could like touch and hold them and give feedback on what he thought. And that was kind of like these little pieces here kind of thing? Yeah, or I mean, I don't know if I don't remember if I sent a picture or not, but it, you know, our connections, our um, sometimes profile sections and things like that. Um, yeah, early fuselages or sort of wing section, wing tip, you know, yeah. just to just to for me to touch it and yeah, and it. So, but be, oh, sorry. I just picked up basically the dimensions from what seemed to be working from my thousands of experiments over a couple of years and I gave the rough dimensions and then Stefano would pad it, make it into a final product. And then we had somebody, I believe in Kansas, making our first aluminum molds, which were, you know, reasonably pricey, but for, as he said, a uh, lot better tolerances and also option of cooking it in the oven to get the proper mass strength uh, we had to go the aluminum route and pressures i mean we we clamp our molds together i mean everybody knows we do a, a wet layup process and uh we use really high pressures which obviously 3d printing doesn't can't hold up to it mm -hmm. so but these original molds i guess the this part here was the three pin 3d printed part and then you put exactly. like resin just, underneath it and yeah. then mdf boards and then just kind of yeah. made your own molds out of um yeah out of 3d printed materials for prototyping yeah. basically right yeah. yeah yeah and and i since since those 
the early days. I have done this um, a couple more times when I want to do something that's just so ridiculous that it's not worth spending, you know, a few thousand on an aluminum mold and then find out that it doesn't work, you know. So I, I did a flying wing concept many years ago um, with this same process. Okay, and then I guess this this picture here is like uh, the where the mass is right on top of the foil, but the foil is like angled forward. Yep, looks yep. like a good way to catch seaweed, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but but how did it work? We I I think we ended up not doing such a forward rake when we I think this was like maybe one of the very first sketches. Um, Just a sketch. I, I bet you it would turn really good. And I know <laughs> Oru brand did this forward. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and then this, this looks like, what, what year was this? This, this is kind of an older, older, older article, huh? The world's fastest kite boards. Kite boards by Dave Wells. Wow. I... So if it's a kite board, I bet you it's about 2000. 14, maybe 13. And yeah, I went straight from windsurfing, making boards from for Johnny Heineken, Adam Cook, and all these really fast guys. And again, they took it straight to the world championship binning. Johnny was at least two or three times world champion on the three fin kite race boards. Yeah, right there. <laughs> so, and then this, I guess this was before foiling, right? Th these were just exactly. with a regular fin on the back and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Three fins, yes. Oh, three fins. Okay. Wow. Which yeah. ironically turned into be perfect for learning wing foiling. <laughs> yeah. And then, they, and then there's these asymmetrical um, speed boards. Huh? That's kind of cool too. That's Rob Douglas, who was always, and he still is now pursuing speed on wings with my foils, and he's buying all kinds of wings, trying to go fast. But this was at the time when kites were actually holding the world speed record for sail-powered craft, and he was asking me to make his boards with his ideas, his dimensions, for different conditions. I believe at the end, I probably made about 27 of these for him. <laughs> wow. So, so at, the, um, at that time, I guess, yeah, the kites held the world speed record for sail power. Um, who, who's holding it now? Like, what is it? Is it foils or, or still regular um, boards? Well, but, so he got his world record 55.55 knots, which held for, I think, a couple of years. And then the little boat, Stefano may know the name. I think it was some kind of attraction foil with a sail. Yeah, the Vesta sail rocket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sail rocket disintegrated at the end of the run by by obliterating that 55, 55. <laughs> maybe over 60, but it could never be repeated because the boat was in in pieces. <laughs> Oh wow! So and then, and then that's still the world record that that's um the current world record, or did they so. did they get the world record with that run or yes? No, they did. They, they, they did, did, and then at the end of the run, the bo boat just kind of did, uh, self destruct well, well, self destruct. On, on, honestly, I don't. I I know the when the sail rocket had their big crash. I don't think that was the record run. I think I think I think they went and re rebuilt and, and did the record run after that but i believe they still have the record hmm. oh and this yeah this image here is just i have a portfolio site just showing a, the depth of my work i've done everything from consumer electronics to toys to, to clothing um a lot of, a lot of people think since i'm involved you know in the design side of mike's lab they think i'm you know uh an aeronautical engineer or you know, a naval architect, but I'm not. I'm I'm really just as much an artist as I am um, uh, a tinkerer, if mm -hmm. you would say. So even like first class airline seats and things like that, you worked on. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Yeah. And what what is this like a um it's a little MP3, you know, boom box from back in the day. Uh, and there's some other Bluetooth concepts there. I was working for a design firm for a while where we did shoe concepts for Nike. I've Thank done goodness. everything from, you know, multimedia commercials to some compositing work to web design and coding and things like that. So a little, little bit of everything, everything under the creative umbrella. The slipper looks a little bit like a kite surfing foot strap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe there's some subconscious influence there. What, sure. what What's this one? The Air Force uh, uh, water plane. Oh, I've, so so I all my life I've been into you know radio control everything and and this kind of ties into the hydrofoil design and I, I, it's the same with Mike in the sense that we've all the things we've been into in our life we've always thought about just the way fluid flows. So neither Mike nor I are you know, uh, like I said, aeronautical engineers, but but we definitely lie awake at night thinking about flow. And um, so I've done, yeah, that was a, a, a scratch built radio control airplane I built and I've done discus launch and RC helicopters. And I um, there was a period of my life where I was skydiving for about 14 years. And I also designed and built a parachute. So I've even designed and built foil kites as well. So just flow fluid flow interesting and then this this looks like a covid safe cafeteria design is that what it is <laughs> no it's an old for it's a old library furniture from a oh, much okay. old just for uh, privacy or like uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly yeah yeah so not um not the covid flowing across the table yeah no no <laughs> no no and and since since 2019, that's all I've been doing is the hydrofoil. So before 2019, I was mixing in consulting and you know working on the hydrofoils with Mike. Um, but since 2019, it's been just full time hydrofoils. Which okay. even then, even with Mike producing in California and me producing in Europe, yeah, the wait list is still often three, four, five months. It kind of depends on what model uh, and where the person is located. Yeah, and then so I, one so, of the pictures in that uh, portfolio shows Nico Parlier, and for about three years we were dominating the racing circuit on our kite foil, and our waiting line just absolutely exploded. It was pushing past two years waiting time, so. Hmm. Before wow. everybody else learned how to make proper foils we were definitely there uh having very very successful race design and i think nico parley were at least two times world champion daniela moros at least three on our foil and maybe johnny i think was as well one once or twice yeah, and I think it's really, really important to point out that, you know, when people think of Mike's lab, they first think of Mike, and then sometimes they think about me, but the re the reality mm -hmm. is it's really kind of like a big team project. I mean, if it wasn't for the valuable input and feedback of Nico and Johnny and Ricky Lachess and Connor and all, just the whole slew of, of racers giving their input, then, of course, our hydrofoils wouldn't wouldn't be where they are today. So I just got got this foil, the um, Bullet Six, and uh, it's it's uh, yeah, it's beautiful. I only tried it one time for a short time to test it out, and um, it definitely felt fast and very efficient. So, um, but I'm wondering, like, how many people do you have uh, working on these? And like, do you, did you actually do some of the work on on this foil, or like, who who, who actually builds these foils? You're I looking at them. <laughs> yeah, I believe I built this one and shipped it to you. And the only thing I have done by somebody is to cut my pieces to be laid inside the mold. So if you imagine a roll of carbon and I need to have the pieces pre-cut, I have somebody doing that, but everything else I do myself. So the pre preg yeah. carbon basically cut into um, into the the pieces that fit into the mold it's not even pre prep it's oh, dry carbon. it's dry carbon and, and then, then it's saturated by liquid resin 
so the resin do you um like vacuum it into the mold or do you lay it out um wet it out before the mold closes how, how does that work yeah exactly just wet it out piece by piece into each half of the mold and then the two halves come together and hopefully next morning it pops open with what you have it yeah. obviously needs a lot of cleaning after it comes out of the mold but yeah, yeah. i mean so i guess this one looks like the whole the fuselage and the whole front foil is all one piece and then it looks like the the tail is kind of molded separately and then connected here is that correct no it's all molded in the same time what you probably are looking at is our own mold connection it looks like it's been connected but no it was all laid up in in one time one piece and that's because we have to screw the wings to the fuselage from each end of the fuselage right so mm -hmm. you can see the seam of the mold on that final product but other than that it's all one piece and our philosophy was back then trying to make a race foil the less connections and the more in center the wings are in relation to the fuselage the less as stefano called it peak acceleration we're gonna encounter so if you have to screw the wing from one side or the other you have bulk of the fuselage and meat necessary to for the screw to go in on one side and that's your unnecessary drag through the water so we decided to go this route and learn how to build it and it's reasonably efficient making it this way that we don't have to spend time you know making pieces there machining them together screwing them together mm -hmm. this way we can fine-tune it for the customer who may not have the ability conditions or time to do it themselves so they get something what's already fine-tuned and you the only way to really mess it up is to run from the reef or something. Oh, I know. Um, this foil looks so nice. I'm I'm really scared of, of getting it scratched up. So the spot I usually foil that is really shallow. So and and then the mass I got is like 102 centimeters. So um I'm probably only gonna use it in in deep water spots. Um, yeah, but I think you change it from 96 to 102. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no for racing it's definitely nice that especially downwind racing i wanted to ask like these it has these little blue um fibers in in it like what what is that and what, what it's what are those early on like? it was for me to kind of i used to go to the water with up to six different boards and foils on shore and i would go in and out with a kite back then mm. and I figured out how to kind of mark them visually for me because if you go in and out, you forget which one felt what and why. <laughs> and I had these color coding type uh, visuals. And I remember, oh, the orange one felt this way and felt good. Let me look how I build it. What What is the pitch when I came home or to the shop the next day? And I think it also gives it a little bit of a character, you know, when people have the same foil at least they can recognize which one is theirs especially running into the racing line sometimes people would grab somebody else's board in the past if you can't believe it like Vincent surfing boards i made so <laughs> this way it was a little bit you know recognizable on the first glance okay so so that this is basically the color just so you can each each foil is a little bit different and you can yeah, um, recognize which which one's which yeah, and then yeah, I noticed it's, there's on the it's, and it's fun for us too. Just it changes things up. I, I like to use pigments and tints too when I'm doing mine, and it's fun because you can see the difference between my and mine, and just changes. Yikes! Your connection is really slow now. I think. Yeah. <laughs> we're kind of breaking up a little bit but and then yeah on the mask too it has like these little colors and stuff like that so it's just yeah, kind exactly. of to make it a little colors, bit unique each one right each piece yeah and the colors could be almost any color i, I get a fiber in different colors and the pigments in different colors so yeah it just can be limitless 
So, and then the other thing that I found really interesting is the connection between the mast and the fuselage. Um, and basically, rather than having it kind of, you know, like a lot of foils have kind of almost like a box, a little bit like a tuttle box where the mast goes into the foil. But it looks like you try to kind of, it's more like you're maximizing the surface area where they're connected and, um, and get yeah, it. Like it's a, not only the surface area, it's also not weakening the fuselage. The fuselage has to be super strong. Mm. And others using the mini tuttle, if you can really pay attention, for example, lift, right? Lift foils, they do the mini tuttle. And if you look at the fuselage size on their foil, it's massive. So I don't know if they ever will be able to go top speed, even though they do pretty well. But the disadvantage of the mini tuttle is that your fuselage has to grow. Yeah, it definitely introduces a weak spot. Like on my on my um, access fuselages, um, there's like several that had got little cracks right here, you know, like right at the um, end of the mast where it inserts into the board because that's just like a, a, the sides are relatively thin, right, of, next to the bo box. So I guess so. Basically, part of it is just to have more strength right here in that in that connection, right? Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, it transfers a little bit too much stress. That's that's the. the and then explain how this little screw works, because um, I guess whole... this, with this screw, you can change the, the angle of the tail a little bit. Um, is that correct? Like, can you explain how, th how that works? Because I haven't really tried that yet to put a washer or something in here. Yeah, you could, but it's not necessarily. So, so... Yeah, go ahead. Well, but I... I mean, I, I think we got to take two steps back here because a lot of people that are probably listening to this that are coming from the wing foiling or the prone or surf foiling and maybe I've never heard of Mike's lab before. Well, this connection system that we develop has been copied by many other brands, which is sort of a testament to how well it works. And the design... The, the crux of the of designing a hydrofoil is is you have to marry what would be the hydrodynamic ideal with what is mechanically required uh, in order to to just support the stresses involved. And so that's why we very quickly, our very first foils, yeah, we had like a detachable, you know, front wing and detachable rear wing. And then we quickly realized, as Mike was saying, that there's just way too much drag there in order to be able to house all the extra hardware, so on and so forth. So that connection system is to be as efficient and small as possible, but still be mechanically sound enough. And another misconception that a lot of people have is that that little screw is used for the incidents, but it's actually not. When you would like with our kite foils, when we were we had sl smaller diameter fuselages, uh, we would use shims, and we still do with the kite foils. And you can literally you're you're bending the fuselage in order to get an angular change in incidence. So it's not so much that you have to have the little screw, but you just have to have material in there that then you're actually flexing the whole fuselage. Okay. Well, so ba also basically, um, basically the foil is being held by these b three big screws in the front, but, and then this one is kind of to hold, hold a washer if you wanted to um, kind of- No, no, that little screw yeah. stabilizes the fuselage going towards the back wing. We are using the mass, mass and strength to keep the fuselage attached as long as possible before it has to go on its own to hold on to the back wing. And early on when I was testing the kite foils, the little screw wasn't there and I could not quite, I didn't like it. It, it was all over the place as far as stability. As soon as I added that little screw manually into one of the foils, it improved drastically. So. The little screw is there for stability mainly. And okay. it, it became an advantage that the pitch of the incidence on the back wing was adjustable by putting reasonably thin shim without damaging something. We could lower the incidence of the back wing right there on the beach. 
and you know go back out. Okay, so so if like let's say I, if I wanted to, if I put a small washer in here in between, that would lower the incidence of the tail foil. So basically, if, if you want if you want to go faster and have basically have less lift at high speeds, that's what it would achieve basically, or is it the other way around? Uh, no, you are correct, but I don't think you need to do that. It's yeah. already pitched to go really fast. You may want to experiment. I don't think it's going to help you with speed or anything like that. In fact, it's going to force you to move your footstep maybe an inch back. Uh, but it, I don't think it's going to buy you anything. It's it's probably going to lower the stability. If you go lower than the pitch you have, uh, I don't think you're gonna see it's, any any good okay. result. That's good if to you know. You can measure it, and it's around two degrees up to two point four. I wouldn't shim it at all. And if you go below two degrees, at least in kite foils, we found that the the foil starts dolphining. If you go really fast downwind, it loses the stability. The back wing is not helping to stabilize the front wing downwind at, at high speed. So you're saying the um, the built-in angle of incidence of the tail wing is about two degrees? Is that correct? E, uh, between two to two point four. And then what about the front wing? Oh, that's neutral. That's always neutral. Neutral zero. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So and, it about, and it and it depends also what back wing it is as well because we have different back wings. Okay. Yeah. Because it's kind of like that's a little bit of a misconception is sometimes, um, yeah, really what matters is the difference between the front angle of the front and the back wing. So, yeah, like. Correct. Um, so yeah. basically your front wing is at zero <laughs> angle of incidence. The back wing is like about two degrees, uh, two to two and a half. Yeah. yeah. And, okay. and, uh, and just to be clear, zero angles for a front wing does not mean neutral lift. It's still giving a lot of lift, even at zero degrees. Right, because of the shape of the profile, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. And I, I mean, I found it was relatively easy to get it up. I was worried that it would take really high speed to to get up on foil, but it wasn't too, I mean, it, it, it worked fine and it just came up just fine. You know, it wasn't like a big thing. Um, we, I, I mean, I tried to erase it last Sunday and none of us were able to get going because the wind was too light and we ended up having to get a boat to take us back in. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, the, but it had nothing to do with the foil. It was just not windy enough. I should mention that my friend, my buddy has the same exact foil you have and that's his favorite. And he just arrived to Los Barrios in Baja and he was going to go out and he did. And he said, oh, my God, this Los Barrios water is really wild. And, you know, it's a little bit less stable. And then he comes in and he sends me a message. I'm so stupid. I put on a kite foil. <laughs> so he went out on his standard kite foil on a wing board and thought, you know, everything is good. And then he comes in and he's totally shocked that he was able to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um. So talk a little bit about the tips here. Um, so uh, it had it's like a little bit. What do I what do I call it? Um, it's like curved downward, but then has a little bit up up curved at the end. So what's the theory behind that? It's like kind of down and then back up again. Yeah, right here. Well, to, help, to make sure that the ventilation doesn't you know if you breach a tip so that the ventilation doesn't propagate back down the wing. I see. So when the wing tips comes out of the water, this tip doesn't um, create ventilation at the tip. Yeah. Well, it doesn't doesn't allow the low pressure or the detached flow from the top of the wing tip to then propagate down towards the root. It, it helps shed that sort of bubble and shed that ventilation. Okay. And then I noticed on the tail wing you have like these little um, winglets. What's the purpose of those? Well, yeah, all those curves on the front wing, which goes straight, but then down, and same thing on the back wing, they bring stability and directionality. So, for example, our 
most successful bullet tree kite race wing front wing had a lot of these curves and it was very stable so yeah you could make a straight wing straight across but it's gonna be pretty it's gonna feel like a banana peel stepping on uh so that first purpose is to get it away from the surface right if you curve it down then you don't breach the first surfaces often and then the directionality and stability comes from that as well and then the tip is relief that uh, as Stefano said it sheds the bubble okay and yeah then, it was three <laughs> so the other question I had um like the the tuttle box uh, tuttle mount um, I guess all your masts have uh, tuttle mounts, and you know it seems like in in surf foiling and wing foiling, most like the the new standard is kind of the plate mounts, right? Um, yeah, the plate mounts with the two two US boxes. So, um, why are you sticking with the tuttle mount? And uh, yeah, I mean, what's what's the theory behind that? Well, right. I mean, uh... yeah, I mean, the the tuttle. I mean, Mike will give his opinion, but my opinion is the the tuttle box is in, incredibly rigid. In any well built board where you have tracks, you have to tie it to the top of the deck anyway, and the tuttle box does that by itself anyway. So, from my standpoint, a two hundred and forty gram box is a lot lighter than than tracks, and that's not even talking about hydrodynamic issues of the plate underwater versus the total box as well okay so okay so it's more efficient and you have the connection to the deck of the board and like the whole box is basically yeah, stiffer and lot, stronger a lot less draggy and it's lighter yeah yeah i mean yeah. In, luckily in our foil boards we have like um the foil strong box we call it when it has both a tuttle and a plate mount um, but some of my newer boards, like the this one behind me, only has the the plate mount. So I guess I'm gonna have to either use a plate mount adapter or just use um, just for this prototype. But um, I'm gonna have to start putting tuttle boxes in all my boards again, <laughs> or both. You know, well, have we, both. We we also sell adapters, and I also make custom carbon plates for clients that really want to have the plate. I'll, I'll do it. It's mm -hmm. it's not like we're we we don't do it, but right. we just prefer the tuttle box makes sense yeah it's it yeah. i think it would be pretty difficult at least for me to build in the plate because you can imagine the resin and fiber kind of running out of the end of the mold now on a vertical situation so the tunnel is a lot more simple and a lot stronger and i think it's the correct way to go the plate has a huge advantage by adjustability back and forth in fact, I think even Nick Leeson from Lyft uh, gave me the credit that I was the first one to put two tracks side by side because he used to use four bolts drilled through the board and attach, you know, from the deck. That's how he was attaching this plate mount system. And mm -hmm. I just, I looked at it and I go, oh, I've been using the windsurfing pin boxes long enough that this could be a lot more elegant and adjustable and it wouldn't leak and sure enough uh it worked and then everybody adopted it <laughs> interesting so but yeah i mean what you said makes sense basically when you're laying up the the carbon inside the mold with the tuttle you can keep all the um layers going straight and and basically the the, the strongest direction versus having to curve them out in a plate mount right so is that is and that, resin that dripping curve? out <laughs> sorry and the resin would be dripping out oh yeah yeah so you would have a big mess when you try to lay yeah. it up right yeah okay that makes sense and then i guess what the why are there so many holes is it just because so that it's adaptable to different types of tunnel boxes i guess <laughs> okay or that came from kite race foils the foot strap had to be incidentally right over the tunnel box so mm -hmm. that's a disadvantage. So people who had tracks for kite race foil, which was very bad, uh, kind of soft, unstable, flexible, but they could put a footstep anywhere they wanted on the deck, right? So once we 
had to deal with the with the tunnel, I figured, hey, we can go to one at least one of the inserts or mounts for the footstrap straight into the tunnel. And that's why this is adjustability for footstrap mounting. I see. Okay. So basically time. you can put the foot strap, the one that goes through the Correct. foot strap into the mass in different positions. Um so that makes now, sense. Do you do kite racers you just use two screws or do you sometimes use multiple screws to hold hold it in the tunnel box? That I was gonna say that. So for winging, I kind of like do two screws up front and one in the back. Not only it makes it a little bit stronger if you hit big fish like people hit whales out here. <laughs> Or I hit a dolphin and some other people actually broke off a wing, uh, not mine. I think it was spots back then hitting a dolphin. Uh, anyway, wow. so the two screws put it in with a lot more strength, right? Because even windsurfers, you can imagine the big windsurf board with the rig and rider on it. If they hit a seal or rock or anything, now the foil is at the bottom of whatever. So if they can use more than one screw, it helps, but they are still using at least locally a little string for the center screw. If you really hit something and the foil falls out, it, it hangs on the little piece of rope of the center screw. And also I kind of like the system because if people damage the barrel nut or if it breaks, the barrel nut breaks, they can just pop one out and put it in the appropriate place, you know, the damaged one. So it's like a spare. <laughs> uh, Built-in spares. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, the other thing I wanted to ask you, like with the Tuttle boxes, one of my pet peeves, and I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm just not doing it right, but it seems like no matter how tight I put it in, like sometimes, you know, like when you're on the water, you're pumping or whatever, all of a sudden you get that little... And it, and it kind of loosens up a little bit because I think it just slides a little bit deeper into the box. Um, like how, yeah, how okay. can I prevent that from happening? It doesn't loosen up. It actually tightens up. So it, the yeah. connection gets more secure between the foil and the board. But your front screw may be a little bit loose. But nobody cares until you hit something like a big fish. Because right. there is always pressure going up from the front wing. So you don't care if that screw is a little bit loose at this point. And that's why I like two screws, because I can crank them against each other. You know, one and the back one, and you can hear it cracking and going in. And maybe that if you would use two screws, it may not happen. The little cracking, what happens to you? Right. And a little, a little so bit like of, you see, oh, sorry, go ahead, Stefano. Of... I was just going to say a little bit of candle wax rubbed on the side of the Tuttle head also gets it into the box with very little friction and allows you to tighten it from the get-go really easily as well. That's a good tip. I'll try that. And Johnny also developed this technique for the race foils. He really wanted the Tuttle sitting absolutely exactly how he wanted it, right? So his board height at the deck for the front foot would have to be within literally millimeters. He hated it if it was even quarter inch off. So he would put it in, put screws in, then he would grab the foil, put a board upside down and hit the nose of the board, the deck side against the ground, like grass, right? And you could hear this crack, what you described happens to you on the water. So he would pre-crack it on the beach and re-tighten the screws so nothing could move afterwards. Ah, okay. So that's, yeah. that's another technique. <laughs> so um basically attach the foil, put the put put it with the foil down on and then like no, have the board it, on top on top and push it on foil it, upside down okay. and just hit the gently, you know, kind of just right. The front the of the wing board, holding the foil like this and just top the nose of the board. Oh, okay like you are stepping on it type thing okay you will you will hear this crack and then you can re tighten your screw interesting yeah. check with check with your board maker too yeah that yeah <laughs> yeah well yeah i mean i'm i'm we make most of my own board so but um i guess another misconception too is like that um you know i guess if you hit something most of the pressure obviously is on the on the front connection on the front screw but when you're riding 
the yeah the lift of the front wing actually the the most pressures on that back screw right the back screw because this lifts up and the back screw gets pulled down basically right pull out yes when you're riding but but the the huddle box is designed so that the radiuses the vertical radiuses are taking the load so it's not really it shouldn't be the screws that are bearing that load i mean they they yeah. cinch they cinch it in there but once it's in there it's not depending on the screws so okay so like just to be clear like you're saying the kind of these this side takes a vertical load yeah because it kind of yes. gets wedged into the board basically yeah yeah and then yeah another thing too people sometimes say like oh my board uh, the tuttle box doesn't go all the way in but basically there's supposed to be a little gap in the bottom oh, yeah. of it right like that basically it sits tight on these ends and and then the sides are just parallel right yeah yeah, yeah. that yeah, was the design the board, but, but, but this by Larry Tarlock to have those radiuses at the ends jamming in at 10 degrees each side. And that's where the load was basically taken up. Uh, and yeah, there must be a gap between the top of the tunnel and your board deck of it. Because if there was not, imagine your full body weight would be pushing out a little lamination detail out through the deck and it would just cause leakage. But in the meantime, Starboard brand for foiling windsurfing, they had so many problems with the tuttle box, probably not built properly, that they ended up using the, the roof, basically the top of the box, and issuing the shims so you would install your box just the right way so as Johnny was sensitive to the height of the deck up front for the front foot, now the top athletes for windsurfers are doing the same thing with shimming the top, like you said, on top of the tunnel, and they can adjust the rake of the foil itself against the board. Uh, okay, so by, by basically shimming this yeah. top, you can like change the angle of the mass slightly kind of thing? But in my opinion, it totally defeats the purpose of the radiuses getting jammed into the box. Mm. But their box kept stretching so bad that they had to do this. Mm. So now you don't have the ends cinched or only the sides are holding the foil and it's sitting on the top. It cannot go any deeper, which I think it's crazy, but they are doing it. <laughs> okay, interesting, interesting. All right. Well, thanks for um, thanks for that. Um, something I'm gonna try that. Like like you were saying, Johnny Heineken, um, just like cracking the foil on the beach before getting on the water and retightening yeah. it. Yeah, that's a good they idea. Should, you use two screws up front, the two front ones, and if you smack it and you crank both of them, no way you're gonna do it by sailing it anymore. It's gonna be okay. in there. And for the to put in the second screw, I mean, my box only has two screws in it, two holes in it. So I just, I guess, have to just mark the the exact spot and drill a hole through the tuttle box, basically. Correct. I don't know. We use quarter inch G10 on top of the tuttle, so we can actually put the screws in anywhere we want mm -hmm. and countersink them. So in case you are not using the pad, you can still comfortably step on it. So in case you do have some solid support for your second screw, yeah, you can just drill it one and one eight back from the front hole and you're going to be exactly in the right spot. Mm. Well, actually, I was just thinking like on my, on most of our boards, the, the deck is thicker than the tuttle. So there's a hole for the screw to go into the board into the board. So but anyways, yeah, something something to play around with, I guess. Oh wait, are you using yeah. like Alexis boxes? It's similar to um the GoFoil boxes, yeah. We we make our own with a full strong box, but um oh and does it does it have the screws uh, vertical like 90 degrees or are they originally it's taken um, from tuttle design? Um, it's, a, it's like kind of, um, like the straight, like the gold foils. Yeah. So be careful when you are first putting in your 
spoil, you need to rotate the barrel nuts by those few degrees because original Tuttle design is about 10 degrees right back. Right. So yeah, that could be a little issue, but yeah, I'm trying to like give enough space for the front and back to be, to be cantered back by 10 degrees. It was original design for windsurfing and windsurfing decks for slalom boards. They were sloping down, right? They were getting thin as you go towards the tail. Uh, so that's why that 10 degree, uh, slope. Yeah, I'm just sharing, like, this is kind of what our, we have, like, a, a box that combines, oh, like, the Tuttle and the foil, um, the plate mount together. And then the top has this, only the two holes, though. Yeah, then then just use the two holes. Don't bother yeah. with it. They're screwed. Yeah. It's good enough. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it seems to work fine. I, I think just, like, getting it um, super tight before you get on the water is the key, I think. Or or even maybe breaking, bringing in a screwdriver. So. Um, yeah tighten it on the water if it's necessary but as i said you never need to tighten it on the water as far as having a secure connection the only reason to do it is if it feels uncomfortable stepping on it if you know what i mean mm. but if you have a pad it shouldn't even matter i think if, like when you're pumping you know when you're when you're pumping and like there's a lull and there's no wind and you have to pump through the lull Sometimes that pumping will will um it's right, but not, yeah, then it... you don't want that that rocking thing of your mass rocking. Oh, so you are saying it actually goes back out until it hits the screw? Wow. Well, I mean, I think like yeah, like you said, it goes a little bit deeper, but then the screw is loose. So when you're pumping, there would be a little bit of wiggle back and forth. Um, so you can you're... feel the foil yeah. going this. Yeah, I've never seen that. Never. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I just maybe be, didn't put it tight enough. You know. Yeah, tunnel box should be tighter than that. It it mm. should go in there with the friction, and that friction should stop this. If the back screw is tight, I don't think it will pull out the front. But I I never heard of it yet. So okay, okay. That's a good one. <laughs> All right. So and then I also noticed that the whole the whole thing is pretty light. Like I mean, I also have axis the axis um, foils, and it just like it just a little bit more weight, and and the, the, this this whole foil feels pretty light. So how do you achieve that? I guess I mean I guess you just kind of minimize the amount of materials needed by just making it smaller, or like how yeah how do you keep it lightweight? Well, for for starters our sections are much thinner than what people are usually used to out there. Um, I mean, uh, when I see the, the profile thicknesses of, of, of some of the other brands at like 15, 16, 17 millimeters, uh, we're, we're at 12.3, 13 millimeters. So already there's less volume there. Um, and then we also have core materials in order to get you know, good compaction. So it's, it's, it's not solid carbon all the way through. Um, so that's do you use wood why. inside wood or foam or what do you use inside the foam? Is it that's secret? proprietary? proprietary. Yeah, we, okay. we, some, we have secret sauce, secret sauce. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. I respect that. <laughs> um, okay. So, so like the, and then what, like on this mass, it has like a little strip of unidirectional, um part of the way i think it stops at some point but oh it, that's just for fun that's another that, one of yeah those okay <laughs> another thing along with these co funky colors and stuff like that yeah <laughs> okay cool um all right so yeah i mean what what else um about the foils that's that you um want to mention that's unique about your foils Well, I'd say what's what's unique is you don't have to do anything. They're they're plug and play. Um, into into like as Mike was saying before, the incidents you don't really have to adjust it, especially not with with wing surfing relative to kite surfing. Um, the, the the speeds and the 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 balance is a little bit different. Um, so the, the our foils are definitely just go have fun. And in my opinion, the less you do something to it, the better, you know, a lot of people ask like, how should I sand it? How should I eh, just, just, just don't do anything. The, the less is the less you do, the better. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And then I would say one unique characteristic that a lot of people tend to say or be surprised by is just how easy they are to use. I think a lot of people, since they know we come from a racing heritage, are maybe afraid that, oh, maybe the foils are like difficult to use or something like that. But the reality is a good race foil is easy to control because that gives you the confidence to then push it and go fast. And, it, and it's no different with all our wing foils as well. They're, they're just easy to use. Mm -hmm. Well, another thing is I'm basically demoing the foils to anybody who's interested to hop on it. And usually all it takes is once. And some people have to order it right in and there because it's a lot speedier, less drag, more stable, more fun just to use it than anything they tried before. I, we have people which claim they have tried everything there is on the planet made. And they say, yeah, we just buy yours and <laughs> multiple models just because it feels unique. Yeah, I mean, um, Alan Cadiz actually kind of uh, on this interview, he talked about the Mike's Lab foils and winning a race with it last summer on Maui against all the young guys and stuff like that. So that kind of convinced me that, okay, I got to try, try one of these foils. So, um, and yeah, definitely what you said about, um, the, you know, being able to control it. I mean, basically every foil has that kind of a, a max, it seems like a maximum speed that's kind of built in almost. And you want to try to get as, as get and stay as close as you can to that maximum speed and then yeah the how easy it is to control it at that speed is really important because yeah i mean it's hard to push it to that limit if it's really um hard to control it at high speeds right so makes sense yeah. Yeah. okay and um what about the fuselage length um i guess that's just something you you tested and and kind of came up with a, a good length there <laughs> That may have been the worst uh, design feature because, again, we have to have it made out of aluminum to be able to properly assemble the mold and build it and cook it. And coming from very short fuselages on kite foils, wind surfers were tried to use and they were not happy. So it kept growing from super short kite fuselages to super long over one meter for uh, windsurfing foils and then winging came on the scene and now we started trying the windsurfing on a wing board wing foil and that was way too long so this whole harmonic of the fuselages was very frustrating because I had to have so many molds made and then you still have to test it and people get better. The wing sizes, like the foil wings, get smaller, bigger, and they work differently with each other. And then the wings, handheld wings, they get better, faster, and different sizes push differently on a foil. So that's definitely very frustrating or was. But now it kind of settled in for each wing i kind of like to use certain length and it seems to work uh, yeah that's not to say that it's not gonna change still but hopefully <laughs> and, yeah and, and i mean there's different geometry configurations based on what front and rear wing we have and then one general comment i'll make um you know a big difference between wing foiling and kite foiling is is there's just so much more um difference based on people's local conditions as well um in the sense that with with kite foiling you know when we were developing the stuff the kind of mentality was well if it can work well in san francisco it's going to work well everywhere but the reality is with wing foiling is you've got you know one guy who wants you know a shorter mass because of the amplitude of his waves and then you've got another one who wants open seas and high water another guy who wants a longer fuse because that's what he likes and is used to and another guy who wants a little bit of a shorter fuse so um yeah on one hand things are kind of settling but it's never going to settle like it was with kite foiling where you have a very sort of specific size that everybody can kind of get into i think personal preference plays a huge 
role here. Interesting. Also, whether it's salt water or fresh water, right, that, that makes a big difference in the amount of um, lift or like the... A little bit, but that doesn't affect our geometry choice. That does, that's never affected like what front wing we're going to pair with what back wing and what fuselage length. But you, uh, generally speaking, for fresh water, you probably need a slightly bigger foil, a little bit with a little bit more lift. Is that right? To or because the salt like, water is denser, or does, is that not sure, really? That yeah, in, in theory. But then, but then at the same time, you know, it, it's all trade offs. So, so you, you're you're talking about like such a tiny little window to play in right there. That that okay. So it's going to be a little bit faster in the fresh water then. So yeah, since I keep going between. Sherman Island, which is a freshwater location, and Chrissy Field, constantly switching between fresh and salty. It did have some effect on a kite foil, especially when Sherman Island, the water would be murky with a lot of mud flying in. Then the lift felt a little bit underwhelming. One inch adjustment on the foot strap would usually fix it, or, you know, deep pitching for Chrissy field also would fix it but for winging i don't even feel that at all so mm -hmm. it's all the same okay interesting and then basically like you're saying earlier basically that this little seam back here is where it's a one piece mold but you can uh, like basically unscrew the tail piece and put a different tail piece on there or maybe a different fuselage length or something like that all right that? exactly oh, okay that's kind of smart way to do it interesting all right. So can you talk a little bit about like your um, process of, you know, when you when you come out with a new design, like how do you test it? You know, like what you know, how do you um, get feedback and like what do you yeah, what's your R&D process? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's either Mike will come to me with an idea or I'll go to Mike with an idea. And I think a lot of the success of our designs, because a lot of times we disagree. So we sort of. <laughs> talk back and forth and kind of try to get clear in our heads about what we're thinking about something. And um, I, I would say earlier on in the R&D, there would be a lot more analysis. I mean, we, we've never done any, you know, full-blown CFD or anything like that, but um, I used to do some basic analysis, but now we've done so many foils and we're such a fan of sort of just trial and error, get out, get something out on the water and, and um, sort of a, uh, and evolve our designs since we have such a solid foundation of so many foils that we're, we know how well they work and kind of it's, we can predict really well how something will, will work out. So we'll generally do a design and then tool it up and then lay it up and uh, test it uh, ourselves, but also with, you know, our trusted clients that love trying new stuff anyway and our great kind of benchmarks. They, they know since they've tried all of our other foils too, you know, if something's an improvement or not. Nice. So do you have like a big pile of old molds that you don't really use anymore or, or not? Yeah, at Mike's house, house, yeah. I should have taken a picture and shared it with you. It's a forest <laughs> under my carport. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> it's got to be a couple yeah. of tons of aluminum there. <laughs> Can you recycle yeah. those? Or I guess you could melt them down and make new molds at some point, maybe? Yeah, somebody <laughs> probably could. I didn't get to schlep it out you, of you it. You could, yeah. No, and last time I was with Mike, uh, I remember looking into the price of scrap aluminum, and it, it was pretty <laughs> underwhelming. It was, it was yeah, almost... it's not worth almost, all the labor to bring it. You know, be better recycling. leave it... Yeah, leave the graveyard there until it becomes yeah. more valuable. Maybe maybe it'll <laughs> come back into fashion. It's kind of like um, you know, clothing fashions exactly. come back. Maybe like go exactly. back to the foils you had in back in the two thousands, <laughs> early two thousands. Or at but, least okay. the scrap price of aluminum goes up. <laughs> yeah. So um, what's new? I mean, what what can you share a little bit about what you have in the works without you know without giving away your secret sauce, obviously? But um, what are you working on right now? Well, the last thing that we did is uh, developed an 1150 high aspect wing. Um, we already had an 1100, but um, I wanted to make something that's a little bit more efficient in sort of that same um, size range. 
And um, it's based off of the plan form of our 540 wing set, which was really successful. Um, and uh, so that's uh, in production now and uh, extremely pumpable. You know, it's, it's very high aspect, so it's not going to be the turniest thing, but it's super pumpable and super efficient. Um, and uh, in terms of, you know, moving forward and things down the pipeline, we're always trying to, you know, make our connections better, our masks stiffer, just subtle, subtle changes, nothing, nothing so revolutionary. 1150, is that the, the square inch uh, surface area? Square centimeters, yeah. Square mm -hmm. centimeters, I mean, yeah, sorry. Um, and the 540 is 540 square centimeters? Yes. What about we have, we, have, we have foils as small as 410, so a uh -huh. speed foil that we also do a tow in version of that for um surf, and that's gone as fast as 46 knots in terms of speed, uh, under, under kite traction. Wow, uh, and we go all the way up to a 1600. So how how what's the surface area of the uh, bullet six? Because I couldn't really find that. Is not a, that looks, that's an eight hundred. That's an eight hundred. No, it, it's a six hundred, I believe. Oh, okay. Bullet six. Yeah. No, it's not a bullet six. It's not. It's a, it, no. Oh. It's six hundred uh, winging or or windsurfing foil. Oh, okay. And it's true size, I believe. Stefano said it's six thirty. But we call it 600. Okay. Yeah. Bullet six is a completely different, lot smaller kite foil. Oh, okay. So this is okay. I'm I'm, I'm not even sure which exactly. I thought it was the bu um, bullet six. Oh, this is a 600 wing. It it oh. should say on that. Um. What does it say? Um. 680 span. So 600 is the square centimeters. 80 is tip to tip. Oh, okay. And the fuselage measurements, which measure from the center of the middle big screw, if you take a tape measure, and go to the back wing and same to the front wing. Ah, uh, okay. So you have you have your front wing size, area and span. You have your fuselage length, forward, backwards, and then you have the type of a back wing, all on that label. Nice. Okay, got it. All right. So um, I guess the other thing I wanted to ask you about is like, you know, how you're the state of your business. And um, let me know if if we're running out of time here. But um, I'm, you know, I just kind of get always get caught up in the conversation and kind of go <laughs> go along. But yeah, um, if you have to go, just let me know. But I wanted to ask you, like during the pandemic, I mean, wing foiling just been booming, you know, and it seems like everything was in short supply. Long time. You, it's like super hard to get anything it's hard to get the new wings and the new foils and the boards um and then it seems like this year it's kind of everything's kind of back in stock and slow down a little bit um a lot of i think a lot of uh, manufacturers kind of overstock now a lot of brands are trying to get rid of their old old inventory so it seems to kind of change from being super short supply to being a little bit oversupply maybe now has that affected you at all or have you noticed that that I guess you've always been um, had more supply than demand. So, but has that affected you at all? Yeah. Well, I mean, th th that sort of um, contraction and expansion that you're talking about, I think, is mostly supply chain related stuff coming out of Asia because a lot of the big manufacturers are not made, you know, domestically um, or even in Europe. So, so, but so from the pandemic, I personally have, have seen, you know, some costs of my materials go up due to those same supply chain problems and cost of shipping to get the materials to whether it's the loom that's going to weave the carbon fiber or what have you. In terms of actual demand, what was interesting for us and the pandemic and the timing of the pandemic is it was shortly after um, we had just been um, kicked out of the IKA. So we were on track to, um, with a third party producer, um, do large numbers of kite foils. And then that didn't happen. Um, and then the pandemic hit. So we saw a big slowdown in the request 
not to zero, but a big slowdown in the request for a product up sort of towards the following winter, but not so much the pandemic it was just because of a lot of our kite foil customers, you know, had to make the choice and buy another brand's kite foil. But now um, I'm sure Mike would probably agree with me. I, I would say 95% of our client base is they're all winging. Everybody's winging now. Mm -hmm. So things have just, just taken right back off and just exploded. Excellent. Can you, so I mean, I'm not, I don't really follow the, the kite foiling scene that much. Um, I'm more, you know, more into wing foiling myself, but I'm just curious, like, um, and I saw something on, on your news and on your website about that. Yeah. Um, so what happened and why aren't they allowing your foils in, in the, in the racing? Uh, I'm just curious. Well, to make a long story short, um, they, put us into a position where they demanded what we consider our intellectual property. And if we were to give that to them, we felt that it would not be in the long-term interests for our business. I mean, we would be shooting ourselves in the foot. Essentially, it would be kind of like a cooking competition saying, okay, everybody make your best soft drink and Coca-Cola is doing it. And then they demand the recipe from Coca-Cola. Yeah, like Coca Cola would never give away their recipe. Mm -hmm. So we we put our foot down and said, "Look, we'll give you you know A B C materials, but we're not going to give you X Y Z." And they said, "Okay, you're out." Wow, interesting. So they wanted to know exactly all the materials that go into the foil or something like that, and 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 their position foils. and the data sheets. Huh. So, and themselves videotaping the process. They wouldn't even let us do it. They would have to do it. Watching us, filming us doing it. Wow. That Yeah, I mean, that seems very strange. Unbelievable. Hmm. And then basically, yeah, that, that seems strange that they would make that a requirement. But yeah. And then basically all the other manufacturers complied with that? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So um, wing foiling, is is that something you guys do too personally? Are you both into yeah. wing foiling? Oh, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So tell, yeah. tell us a little bit about your, like, your favorite boards and wings. Like, what do you use and what kind of conditions do you go out in and what foils do you use? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm um, a 90 liter board. Um, I've tried as small as uh, like 78 liters, but I'm just happy with 90 liters. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm 6'4", I'm, I'm 185 pounds, um, and I love just mowing the lawn, like back and forth, like I'm a happy guy. I, I, I do races over here in Italy and Europe. I, I just got second in the old man grandmaster category at a big race in Lake Garda. Um, nice. So... I, I like to turn on the heat once in a while, but I don't, I, I can't, you know, pump all day long, like some of these younger guys. Um, but I, I, my favorite lately is I'm usually on the 800, you know, wing set. Um, that's, and then I'll pull out the 1600, you know, in really summertime light winds, because I'm in very different conditions than Mike. I have the Mediterranean coast and then I'll go up to Lake Garda sometimes um, but sometimes we have really light thermal winds, you know, holy winds, and mm -hmm. that's when sometimes I'll need a little more surface area. So with the 1600, you're able to get up in really light winds and, and kind of stay up, pump through lulls and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our, how, much, this, how much do you give up on your top speed, like when you use a 1600 versus a 800 or whatever? Well, our 1600 is not like any other brands 1600 in the sense that it's an extremely thin profile so um it's it it takes like a couple knots more to get going than maybe like other brands uh, of the similar surface area but then once you're up it just goes and goes as lower drag yeah like I, I can do 20 22 knots 23 knots speed with a 1600 that's not bad at all hmm and then what size wing do you use and which which brand, what, what wing do you use for light wind? 
Um, for light wind, uh, like a six meter, um, I've had ozone wasps. I'm also tinkering with uh, my own design of a wing. So I'm on prototypes. So six meters is kind of the biggest? Yeah, yeah. Do you find that like sometimes when you go bigger, like especially the wider wingspans, it gets so wide that you can't really um, drop the wing enough to get a um, yeah. get forward momentum from it, right? Yeah, that's kind yeah, of. Yeah, I, def I definitely feel like there's a point of diminishing returns, and then tacks become almost unbearable um, due to leading edge diameters and things like that. Mm. Okay. And then what, um, so for racing, like what, how long is the board? You said about 90 liters. How, how long is, are your boards? Do you use a little bit longer boards just to be able to get going easier or? No, I, it's, it's, well, I don't, it's 152 centimeters long in inches. I don't know what that is, but yeah. Okay. I'll have to get out the calculator myself. Okay, yeah. What about you, Mike? Well, I guess I'm lucky I live in pretty windy area. So I did learn on a 1300 pretty original one we made and I plugged it into the three fin race board, which you showed a picture earlier. And I learned on that and it worked pretty good. And I still see people using that kind of a combination. But then uh, within a few months, I made my own board, uh, still floaty, but something a lot more oriented and turnable as far as winging goes. Then I made another one, and then a couple local guys, Johnny Heineken is one of them, they asked me to show them how to make boards, and so they could make their own, and they sure do ever since. And then the third one was Kenny shortly after that, and Kenny, I went back and forth on WhatsApp, and he started making boards. He even built his own shop right next to his house because he has other job, a lot better. <laughs> than uh, building boards. Anyway, so I made two boards and after that, Kenny took over and he's supplying me with the best boards in the world. They are ridiculously light. Uh, people cannot even believe it when they pick it up. They are like seven pound range for, I don't know, 75 liter board. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't have to worry about boards and I guess I supply him with the foils. <laughs> Oh, th this is one of your wing boards here. Oh, okay. uh, this is one. Th this no, this is one I made for Jan Blasted. This is a picture from not this latest uh, Garda race, but the one before last. He he won the Grand Masters there. Uh huh. Yeah, That's so pretty. Like John. It's pretty. That's a six, pretty stubby. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, okay, and what, what about board weight? I mean, you were saying the board's coming out super light. Um, in do you do you feel like light is always better, or is there in some is in some cases uh, having a little bit of more um, weight in the board can it be helpful in some cases, or or you just always try to go as light as possible? Yeah, always as light as possible. I could see some like surfing big waves, possibly the heavier board will help you, but we never tried it. We are not into those conditions. So for winging, proning, supping, the lighter the board, the more effective you're gonna be pumping it up and down and the less work the front wing, the, the foil will have to do to bring you back up or go and keep going forward basically do the motion up and down, the heavier the board, the longer the board, the worse it's going to be for the foil to overcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I listened to an interview with Dave Kalama where he was saying for the down, downwinders, when he's going really fast, he likes to have a little bit more weight in the board because he feels it's easier to control or, you know, and I kind of, I've kind of found that too when we're downwind racing, I, I'm, I'm, I'm using a slightly heavier board and it feels like um it's 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 a smoother you know it's like uh it has momentum and it's if, like at high speed it feels a little bit easier to control it but i don't know if that's just my imagination but that's interesting uh, i guess i've never been in that situation so 
it, 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 it may be dampening some bad habits from the foil itself. It'll be once you get used to the, the 600 you have, it'll be interesting to see if it feels the same. I mean, you're talking about downwind. Yeah, uh, that, like for, for us here on Oahu, the, most of the racing is um, basically we're joining the um, outrigger or, you know, stand up paddle races that are just like a down, straight downwind run from Waikai to Waikiki or whatever. And it's just downwind. And then at the end, the wind kind of dies off when you come around Diamond Head. There's like, um, you get into this wind hole and then you need to be able to kind of pump through the lulls and, and make it to the finish somehow. But, um, but yeah, so it's kind of different than mo most races. You have to go upwind, downwind. For us, it's just basically going downwind and then yeah, yeah. trying to pump to the finish, you know. <laughs> and you're talking just with the paddle, not the wing, right? No, no, with the with the wing. We're, we're doing oh, with it with, um, yeah, I mean, um, I can't not, you know, imagine. downwind subfoiling is, is another thing, but um, I'm talking wing wing foiling, doing downwind races with the wing. Yeah, that's kind of what we're, we're I doing. I cannot imagine with that foil you have there, having a heavier board being an advantage. If you plug it directly into the tackle box and send it, and if you have to pump, I think, in my opinion, lightweight is the way to go. Okay. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah. All right. Um, so what do you see as the future of the sport? Like, where do you see everything going? And, um, you know, in terms of gear, technique, competition, growth potential, you know, racing versus freestyle, those kind of things, like where, where, where do you see it going? Um, and what, what's your role in it? Steph, take it on. That's a tough All one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it it's 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 definitely exploding we all know that um however i really think it's important to keep things as accessible as possible like i i, I understand our it's a luxury product it's an expensive product um but i already start to see some of the signs of some of the equipment and secondary equipment starting to get pretty stratospheric in prices and that's like i mean you asked like where we would want to take this and i personally would hope that it doesn't go in a direction that reduces accessibility to the sport i think it's so important to make sure that there are options that young people can afford that there's a good solid used market as well. Um, there's always going to be the debate between open class and one design, and there's always going to be people into racing, and there's always going to be people into freestyle and all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's 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 still a sport where competitions like the first place winner brings home barely enough to pay for their plane ticket, if if that. Uh, and so I think we should all be focused on growing the sector as a whole, like, you know, making sure it remains accessible so that as many people can get into all aspects of foiling possible. Okay. Well, yeah, that sounds like a good goal. I mean, especially considering that you probably make some of the most premium foils on the market. <laughs> Well, you know, in, in, in all of this, Mike and I have been incredibly stable with our prices. I mean, there was a time when our kite foils were selling on a used market for more than we were charging new foils because the demand was so high. I even had to write some emails to certain athletes saying, I totally disagree with this because you're you're shooting accessible, you're 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 shooting yourself in the foot with accessibility. You kill the sport by doing that. Um and in, in in other words, what I guess what I'm trying to say is I I hope whatever decisions are made by manufacturers and that are made by um, governing bodies, whether whether it's like wing foil sports or GWA or whatever. I mean, there's already starting to be talk of you know limitations on equipment or this or that. I mean, all that's fine as long as it's thought about. Are we growing the sport this way? Or are we arguing amongst ourselves and shrinking the sport? 
Nice. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about like, okay, my, one last question. Okay. So talk a little bit about the foiling community and, um, and do you have any message for the people that are still listening on this, to this long interview? All right. Um, to the foiling community, let's see. I think there's, um, I think the timing is right to develop a new connection system. Um, but I strongly believe it should be an open source project. I don't think if any one manufacturer comes up with a, you know, some interesting system that's like a Tuttle, but like a plate and it's adjustable and all this kind of stuff. If any one manufacturer comes up with some sort of patented system, I doubt any other manufacturer is going to adopt it or want to pay licensing fees. And even if they did, it would take years for that technology to be adopted. Whereas I think if the community, the foiling community, there's a lot of smart people here, got together and created an open source uh, project complete with a forum and a timeline, a year timeline, everybody could pitch into it. And because it would be open source and the enthusiasm would be there, then I think a lot of manufacturers, ourselves included, would start to see the momentum and start to be uh, willing to gear up with tooling for that timeline, whatever it is, let's say a year from now, let's in one year from now, let's come out with a new connection standard. If it's an open source project, everybody would jump on board and manufacturers would tool up in time and we could get uh, something new and innovative. The Tuttle Box has been an amazing thing and it's, you know, but it was designed in the, what, 80, 82 or something like that. Oh, um, maybe before that. Yeah, so so um, all I'm trying to say is that it's time for a change, but I don't think it's going to happen if it's um, proprietary to one company. Right, and and the plate mount, you just feel like it's not um, it's not good enough to be a, um, a a good like you you don't like it enough to use that because it seems like that's become the standard system is the plate mount, right? Yeah, I think it could be, I think it, it could be improved, you know, if there was something that was um, easy to manufacture and um, friendly to the water, you know, hydro, you know, more hydrodynamic, uh, then I could see it. But um, the combination of the plate itself and tracks is, is quite a bit heavier than a Tuttle box and a Tuttle head. Mm -hmm. And I even think it's a little bit more flexible unless it's done super properly in carbon. And I know F4 does it pretty well, but then it kind of grows significantly towards the board. So mm -hmm. it's got to be a little bit slower. I think our solution is to have a specific adapter, very shallow, to fit our very shallow tunnel base, tunnel head. It's pretty good solution. It definitely is more flexible and it's not ideal, but it's there. It's available for plate mount system. If somebody has that kind of a board, yeah, they can totally grab that. I would not recommend it for 102 mast. It's just too long, too flexible. For 96, it will extend it to 100, which is still pretty good. But yeah, 102 is too long to use the adapter on. Really? So, yeah. because then it becomes, what's about, how many centimeters is it at? About f four centimeters? Or 102 plus four, so 106, now you are too high, and the wing is too far away from you to control properly, I mean, the, the foil. And it also, we can easily measure that the numbers, the torsion and flex are a little bit too far to be comfortable. Maybe that's where your heavy board could be an advantage. I wouldn't know. I kind of doubt it because our three pin race board used to be somewhat heavy for this purpose. And I remember I did not like it, you know, wallowing around, mm -hmm. controlling the foil by its own weight and I had to put too much input to correct wherever I want to go. <clears throat> I guess when, when you're downwind foiling, a lot of times you're, um, 
we we end up going actually faster than the wind because you're you're getting on a bump and and you're just like flying down this bump and you're holding the wing so you don't get back when it holding it over your head and you're just like yeah, shooting yeah, down this bump backwards. and if there's like a little chop on the surface you have to like you know make up for that or you're, you're going to just breach um at full speed you know and and you're, you're really maxing out the speed of the foil and and it's not you're not really using the wing anymore it's just like you're riding the the open, yeah. open ocean bumps going straight downwind and and that's where um, it's all about just being able to control it and and keep the foil in the water and, and not breach. And like I've actually used an Axis uh, 105 mast, I think. And that one I thought worked well, you know, because like the more time you have to react to those chops or to okay. um, keep it from breaching, it seems to help. I'm not, you know? I'm not saying it's too long. I'm saying combination of adapter and the 102 becomes a little bit too soft. So we right. do have a 108 mask for kiting and mm -hmm. people use that constantly, but it goes directly into the board. For winging, yeah. yeah. Okay. And that makes a lot more secure connection and keeps yeah. the measurable numbers where the wing can deflect still pretty low. But once you put 102 into it, the adapter, in my opinion, it gets, I mean, I know youngsters, they can put up with anything. Me right. being a little bit slower on the reaction, I'm not too crazy about it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, so that's a really interesting topic, the whole connection between the foil and the board and um, what the future holds for that. So that would be interesting to see. But um, Mike, do you have any any message for the foil community? I really don't. Have, my specialty is to make something be able to use it myself with confidence and yeah i'm pretty picky and then pass it on and see if somebody else likes it and i really it makes me very satisfied to give people something they like as much as i do and that's just my like philosophy or job that's the way i see myself so as far as predicting and, and directing the, the flow of the industry. No, somebody else can do that. <laughs> right. So, and and you're basically planning to just keep um, keep running the business the way you are, building building the foils yourself mostly, and, and uh, just kind of you're happy just keeping it a little bit smaller, well, or are you thinking about um, doing get, getting more into production or having um, many having it manufactured in mass production or whatever. If I could foresee that somebody would be able to do it properly in production setting, yeah, I, I'm open to it. In fact, I had a very nice option slash idea, at least for the mast, how somebody can actually do it for us. So even if we had mast, mast produced somewhere in China or wherever they would be able to do it properly, yeah, then we can concentrate on the wing sets and the volume we could make would be a lot better. I, with the current technique for the wing set, it would be difficult to outsource it. And okay. I also just want to add too that a lot of uh, sort of the Mike's Lab business too, you know, it's just Mike and I, and we, we have personal relationships with all of our clients and we really like that. And, you know, we really value servicing our existing client base more than getting more clients in the sense that we're Mike and I aren't here to gain market share, so to speak. You know, we're just two humble guys, two humble artisans that just love, you know, making our product and having these relationships with our clients. And I kind of feel that, you know, a lot of, a lot of people say, Oh, why don't you scale up or this or that? But, but um, that's not easy to maintain those relationships we have now and the quality of service and support that we can do now at scale. Right. And the build quality too. Right. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. <clears throat> totally. Mike's, so, um, Mike's. How, how many foils um, do you build and who, who builds more foils? Um, do you um, build more in, in Italy or does Mike build more in San Francisco? Mike builds a, a bit more in San Francisco. His his kids are grown up. My kids are still small. So 
<laughs> at the end of the day. Yeah. A, a little bit less time, but, but um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I'm sure it's a lot of time that you, that you put into it. And like you said, like you have kids and family. So how do you manage that? Like your work-life balance, like one of my goals is just to have more time to have fun, you know, cause it's it, it, life. It shouldn't just be about working all the time. Right. So how do you make that work? And like, is work fun for you? And yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Um, yeah, no, I, I love making things. I'm always making stuff. So, so, um, you know, my relationship here with Mike, it's, it's great because not only am I, you know, producing the foils, but then sometimes I'll dedicate certain days to doing design and CAD work and things like that. So it, it, it changes. So it's always interesting. Um, I definitely don't get on the water as much as Mike does, but I'm not complaining at all because I'm kind of a hermit crab. I really like to sort of go into my corner and just create and build and design, um, so that although I have fewer sessions on the water, they're always on something, you know, that that's like I've made and we've designed and yeah. So I'm happy. Excellent. What about you, Mike? Yeah, you could say that I work too much or I don't have time for too many other things, but I definitely do not cut myself short from going out and in the season here for eight months, 10 months, it's windy every day and I get out pretty much every day. So that really between work and that doesn't leave too much time for other stuff. Uh, but as far as me and work, I really seriously like this foil work. I don't know what it is about it. I keep improving little details constantly. Obviously testing, that's a part of it too. And I have fantastic testers, you know, Johnny, Kenny, when they are on the water somewhere, it could be Hood River, people literally stop and they go like, what the hell am I looking at? Because they are synchronized tracking. It's, it's impressive to see. Yeah. Yeah. Those two are basically testing whatever we can come up with. Yeah, it would be great to get them on the Blue Planet show too and have an interview with them. So maybe um, I'll try to get your their contact from you later. But, yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I just want to say um, thank you so much for your time. I know we kind of went over the hour you um, you, you said you had, but um, really appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody that's listening is going to love this too. I, I, I couldn't find that much information about you online. So I think this will be really helpful for people that want to know a little bit more about Mike's lab. So appreciate it. Yeah, we're, we're very bad about updating our website. This will be an excuse to do something. <laughs> well, we also have to be careful about not uh, promoting too much because we already are a little bit in trouble as far as waiting line and time deliveries. So yeah, we have to keep it just right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it kind of reminds me of Mark Rappahorst, um, because when he, you know, after he sold SIC, he started like the Flying Dutchman, and you know, he just builds boards himself. He's the only one who does it, and um, he, you know, he so he has like a six month or one year wait list, and it just keeps getting longer the more he promotes it. So it's like, yeah. Yeah. you know, what's what's the point in promoting it if you can't can't supply it? You know, so, but that's a great position to be in. So. Uh, congratulations and um, thank you. I appreciate it. And um, yeah, thanks for being on the show. Uh, thanks for having, having us. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Have a good night, Stefano, and a good day, Mike. Aloha. Right. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you, everyone, for watching this episode of the Blue Planet Show with Mike's Lab. I thought this was a really great conversation. And I want to wish everyone happy holidays. Um, I'm posting the Ken Winner interview next Saturday, December 24th. So I uh, hope you can check that one out as well. Um, and uh, I think it's a great end way to end this season of the Blue Planet Show. And then next year in 2023, I'm planning to interview some more great athletes, designers, and thought leaders. And uh, just always hungry to get more information, especially in the sport that's changing so fast. And if you're still watching, you're one of those people that just can't get enough of it. So thank you for sticking around. 
um, you're the ones I'm making this show for. So uh, have a great rest of your year. Happy New Year's. And see you soon. Aloha.